it was about it was about as elegant as a wall clock, really. Uh, <laughs> it's an excellent analysis. <laughs> it was just fine, and now it's just like people show it up, and it's just like it's kind of Twilight Zoney, right? Like the types of things that people get really excited by showing, but the things they should be showing up, they're like, why would I buy that? That's a bad investment. So, um, watch industry is still a little bit in the weirdo zone, but it'll get out of it. Greetings and welcome to this week's A Blog to Watch Weekly. The gruesome foursome are back, reunited, like a bad B movie. We have returned from our various sojourning, although actually I went nowhere, I just stayed here. So it was everybody else. Uh, but the question we forgot to ask last week, but we'll deal with now is A Blog to Watch Watches Watches. There were some international flights, there must have been some movies consumed. Ripley, what did you see? on the flight that had watch content uh i i finally got around to watching oppenheimer so there was plenty of watch content there um let me see what else uh i i tried to do a lot of sleeping when the wi-fi went out so um <laughs> i, I might have missed some good stuff there good stuff ario watch content on the flight Passengers, am, films, pilots. I'm drawing a blank. Look, every time you're on Swiss, all you see is the Breitling ads over and over again. So I can't <laughs> stop thinking about Breitling. Proof that advertising does its job. Okay. Mm. And, and if I you know wish to now. Purchase advertising from a blog I, to watch, please. And I will know us. until the end of time that you can buy a special Swiss Airlines limited edition Bradley watch <laughs> only on certain select flights. And I wonder, I, I spend hours wondering who is the person who's like, that's the one I want. It's not that it's a bad watch. It's the same as everyone else, but it says Swiss Air. That, who is having such a good time in an, in an <laughs> airplane, airplane cabin? They're like, I want to think about this more often. Um, yes. So there's that. Uh, there's just constant brightling in my head all the time now. David, I don't think there was many international flights for your journey, but uh, what's uh, you must have seen something on the street. Best best watch spotting. I had a layover in Munich, so I was just glazing at my notification from Lufthansa saying how we are totally going to miss our 11 p.m. flight. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I mean, I mean, honestly, it's a, it, for one, it's like Swiss Air flying out of Geneva, which is in Switzerland, going to Munich, which is in Germany for Lufthansa, and they can't figure it out. I mean, it's it's it, in the middle of the night, you know. So I, I just I couldn't get it. But anyway, <laughs> thankfully their systems at Lufthansa and Munich melted down, so they had to like check everyone in on paper one after the other, which gave me plenty of time to catch my connection. So that that's the only thing I was looking at. Ah, uh, the analog way, the analog way. Oh, yeah, I did see, I did see a platinum Dayton on the way to Geneva, which was kind of mm -hmm. cool to see it out in the wild being worn. And I saw an aquanaut or something like that on the way back. Something like was, that. Which is not so cool. You see a lot of <laughs> aquanauts and nautiluses now. I mean, especially around Geneva, yeah. it's yeah. ridiculous. And I, I remember, again, the perfectly decent watches, but I remember when I was getting in to all this, they were never the pretty ones. It was like, oh, the kind of awkward um, sports watches that Patek makes that are like, you know, <laughs> you weren't really sure who wears it. <laughs> yeah, the like the poor person's not a little, basically was the image for so long, and now it's so bleeding expensive, right? It was about it was about as elegant as a wall clock, really. Uh, <laughs> you know. an excellent analysis. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fine, and now it's just like people show it up, and it's just like. Yeah. It's kind of Twilight Zoney, right? Like the types mm -hmm. of things that people get really excited by showing, but the things they should be showing off, they're like, "Why would I buy that? That's a bad investment." So, um, watch industry is still a little bit in weirdo zone, but it, it'll get out of it. So, what's next? What's the next watch to capture that zeitgeist? Or is everybody just so entirely depressed in the watch industry just now that nothing's going to catch on? Is there someone or some? Uh, range coming up on on the rails behind the I don't know the Submariner the Aquanaut etc. No, I, I I don't I don't think it's the new double price Aquas. Uh, <laughs> definitely not that one. <laughs> um, look, I think that when economic times are better and people start earning more, they want to distinguish themselves, and that's when they start to pick up more individualistic watches that don't look like everything else so right now everyone want to looks like they made it right so they're like 
I want to maximize the visibility and popularity of the brand of my watch. And that's why there's a small number of, depending on who you ask, four, five, six, seven brands to get the majority of the attention. In a lot of ways on social media, it is true. And it, the psychology behind getting those, again, is I'm not trying to show people I'm unique. It's I'm trying to show people that I made it or I'm okay. But when more people made it, then people want to have a more of an uh, individualized uh, look. And, and what we've known throughout time is that a brand needs a lot of luck. They need to have a, dis a distinctive look. And they have to somehow fit in with whatever is going on in pop culture, which is a lot of randomness. So I, we could sit there and mention brands we'd like to be the next thing. Uh, but again, there's so much randomness that happens. There's like no way we could really predict, but it's fun to try. So, so, so uh, going into that, who does deserve it? Like of everybody you're seeing right now, who deserves to be the next it brand Ripley? All the weird independents. Like, I, you know, all these guys were wearing their like Nautiluses and you know, whatever. They clearly have a lot of the funds to buy expensive watches. But rather than just flexing the obvious move, I would love to just see a bunch of bankers sitting at a bar. One's got on an MVF. One's got on an Acrivia. You know, just everyone's got just some different, different heat. I would love to see that because at a certain point, five guys with the same Nautilus or Rolex, that doesn't really tell you anything. But, you know, and, and you can only bro out so much with another guy who owns a Submariner. Uh, you know, you, you both have the weird like MBNF Evo. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're probably friends. That's like a kind of a niche choice. You know, one's got a Recep, one's got an Acrivia. You can go bond over that. You know, I'd love to just see a lot of these independents because I feel, you know, as someone who owns a Submariner, I don't want to buy another Submariner. I have one. They're not really changing it that much, you know, I, I, but at the same time, you can buy a lot of different independents. They all are very, very different watches. And I think it's just a more compelling thing to collect at that really, really high level. Um, I know people who buy them, obviously, but I don't see them out in the wild as much. You know, it's the guy who owns some really interesting MBNF. And then I see him out, you know, at a bar or something. He's wearing a Royal Oak. It's like, OK, well, fine. You know, so, I, yeah, I, I just want to see the I, I want to see the independence get worn out and about because I think that's a much more interesting thing. It's the difference between seeing like a Pagani in the street versus like you know, mm. just some random Lamborghini. David, if you could knight some watch brand to be the next crown, to wear the next crown, who would it be? Uh, who deserves it or who'd, who'd entertain me most? <laughs> ah, let's go for who would entertain you the most. And don't say Invicta. <laughs> no, it would probably be Hublot, I think. You know, uh -huh. with the colors, the materials and stuff, you know, and, and the designs, the different shapes, uh, all the rest of it. I mean, there's there's an Hublot, even, I was just reflecting on this after watches and wonders that, you know, there's an Hublot that we think of, which is, you know, the Big Bang and all the rest of it. And over the last, you know, couple of years, another layer, uh, another tier of, of, of Hublot has basically fortified itself, which is all kinds of crazy shapes and designs like this, like the Sun Hublot Sapphire is amazing. And, I don't think that Hublot is doing that much these days to remind people how they are totally not just about the Big Bang anymore and how many amazing designs and materials they have. Uh, so maybe maybe that's why I would give it to Hublot, yeah. So let's anoint Hublot our next day, uh, King of the North or whatever. Ariel, Watch and <laughs> yes. Wonders Geneva 2024 Fair Recap. Luxury industry versus watchmaking industry give us a definition what's the difference between the luxury industry and the watchmaking industry that's a great question uh one is there to sell a dream another one is essentially a factory industry that's there to make a product and the funny thing is that watches by definition are not necessarily luxury in fact for most of their history they're not luxury they're just a tool to do something be like forks or something like that there are high-end forks but for the most part the usage of forks is not a luxury thing. But mechanical watches, because no one needs them, but people love them, have turned into almost exclusively a luxury item in terms of their utility. And today's watch industry is an intersection of the factory industrial uh, industry that produces them and the luxury industry, which designs them and markets them and sells them uh, at a high price that a traditional commodity-based approach to selling watches was never able to achieve. And so these industries need each other, but they operate on very different mentalities with very different people and have tons of different incentives. And right now, with very unsure economic headwinds, we have a situation where the watchmaking industry and the luxury industry 
want to approach a uh, current geopolitical situation quite differently. The luxury industry wants to spend and say, hey, look, this is the time to message and to get behind uh, important sentiment, which is going to last uh, with people for the rest of their lives. And the watchmaking industry is like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're a, we're a manufacturing industry. We're worried that people aren't going to want too much of this stuff. Let's scale back all spending because we need to, we need, we don't know how much demand is there is going to be. We want to hold on to our cash because we don't necessarily know what demand is going to look like or what people are going to want for the next few years. So we're going to put the brakes on as much as possible. And so that's a real conflict. And right now, the sort of financier mentality that is both the investor mentality and the factory mentality is winning above the, uh, the creative marketing, um, sales mentality that knows that excitement needs to exist. And one of the interesting ways that you can see that the watchmaking industry is winning versus a luxury industry is that going to these events has never felt less luxurious. There used to be very elaborate parties and tons of very famous people walking around. And a lot of people that sort of looked like they made it or had made it and being at a watch fair like Basel World or SIHH felt like you were at a really serious industry um, event as well as sort of a luxury be seen place. Now it just very much is a, a you know a, 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 a corporate work event uh, where people have to go and struggle for long days. Of course, there's some dinners and nice outfits and things like that, but the sort of celebratory era where even the people there were aspirationally wanting to reach higher uh, I think is agreed that is not there. Uh, and again, the deeper uh, issues I think are well manifest in this concept of the luxury industry versus the watchmaking industry. Are you, you seeing a difference uh, within the groups? I'm curious as to whether the fact that LVMH group is so invested in the world of luxury that actually their four watch brands are operating with a slightly different mentality than, say, Richemont, who view themselves much more as an industrial manufacturer of luxury luxury watches, or even Rolex, or LVMH Group. Because just from the outside, looking at the coverage, TAG appeared to, you know, it, it did look more luxurious at the LVMH Group end as to what was going on with TAG, with Hublot, uh, Bulgari, et cetera, et cetera, even Zenith. Is there a slight tweak difference because they are so tuned into the world of luxury as opposed to just watches? LVMH is definitely winning when it comes to messaging. They know how to keep their headlines uh, positive. They know how to keep their name in the news. Um, of course, everyone could be doing more, but between the major groups, they're definitely doing uh, the, the, the lion's share of messaging and win winning at that. One of the things that they all have in common is having shareholders, and they're all held down by some of the same constraints about persistently worrying about shareholder value, stock price, things like that. A lot of their managers are are motivated by the share the share price, and so that is something that I think actually makes a lot of these groups more in common than different. So I think that some of the differences, while very real. Um, are not as impactful as the similarities that they have, which in this in this era are holding them down. So, David, what do you actually think is going on in the market just now? Because there seems to be, like, everyone is piling in a, a bit like they did with Brevin. Everybody seems to just be piling into the idea that the market is crashing. There is some evidence that sales are slowing down, but you know, the Swiss watch reporting is always a bit vague because it's reporting on generally wholesale sales as opposed to sales to customers. Did you get a feeling for just how up and at it the brands themselves were? Speaking to, obviously, the senior sales guys and all these brands at Watches and Wonders, is it going pear-shaped out there? Well, it's interesting because we have to have these candid discussions because uh, normally everything is just all, you know, just roses basically everywhere, all these brands. When they're talking to media, everything is amazing and the best it's ever been. And once you 
develop some personal connections with uh, with people at these brands and especially just not at PR but um, in other branches that's when you can really learn about these things and um, not just about the state of affairs at the you know in in, uh, in the past couple of months and you know um, whatever their forecasts are but also how they handle these situations and it really varies between brands some brands are just they just keep pumping stuff out and don't really seem to care that much whatever happens and then they will um, suffer the consequences as they had already done many times in the past so some just don't seem to learn while others you know maybe worry a little bit too much so there's a very wide spectrum of, uh, of, of ways how brands prepare for these things overall to answer your question it's a bit of an echo chamber sometimes in the sense that like you know if, if they repeat it to themselves long enough then for once it's for one it's going it's going to manifest itself and for two everyone will start to believe it and act as though there was a crisis even though there you know mm -hmm. one hasn't yet formulated itself right so it's it's we're at this stage currently i would say ripley you spent some time wandering around the smaller micro brand side i think as well at watch and wonders is there a very different sentiment there than there is at the big brands? Are they feeling the heat quicker? Or indeed, are they feeling the heat slower because it's maybe easier to marshal the sale of 100 watches than it is to, you know, the sale of 100,000 watches? Across the board, brands are looking at it as, you know, not it's not going pear-shaped, but we're coming off on several years of just incredibly, incredibly atypically busy times you know people had a lot of money and nothing to do with it during covid and uh this you know a, a downturn if you will is seen in, in like literally every industry i bought more sneakers in the past six months than i have in the past six years simply because i can buy stuff that normally would just be pointless to try to buy because resellers and all of that when people have the excess funds they want to treat themselves more people were buying more watches but then you also have this whole vibrant reseller market of people you know, just trying to glom onto the hype and make a quick buck. And there's so many more watch dealers that have, you know, big, small, you know, random guys peddling, you know, a pocket full of Daytonas in the Diamond District in New York. Like, there's just so much, many more people who have entered the industry because they thought they could make a quick buck during that bloom that I don't think there's so much of a contraction or it's going you know, a downturn as it is a slight correction. A lot of those resellers who never were into it for the watches in the first place, but thought that they could, you know, make a couple hundred bucks by just kind of turning Rolex over in the afternoon have moved on because it's, it's cooling off a little bit. But if you look at a lot of most Rolex models, you still can't buy what you want at retail. Most still trade hands above retail on the open market. So it's, you know, that's still not a normal thing, but the fact of like, you know, we use the Daytona as kind of the mark here, but it's still far above retail. It's just not 3X retail, which was absolutely ludicrous. So, you know, I think a lot of the brands, the smaller brands, you're seeing a lot of really, really high price point watches come from them um, because they don't have that the same quantity. So instead of selling, you know, 20, $50,000 watches, they're going to go sell ten hundred thousand dollar watches because they're operating within that space. I think on the affordable side, it, business is still good. People are still happy to pay for, you know, $700, $1,500, $2,000 for a, a good quality watch. Um, but I don't think it's so much of a contraction as it is just, a you know, an, a, an overdue correction. So it's just, it's becoming the way it should have been had we not had social media and a pandemic. Ariel, we often speak about how the brands that do the best are the ones that, especially during a downturn or a correction, however you want to call it, are the ones that tell the best stories. Who out there has lost the knack of telling a story so that when finally they do need to tell a story, they ain't got any stories to tell? Well, I'll give a, uh, an example of a brand that it's 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 no nothing really bad against them but it's it's very authentic <laughs> report of the situation with their demand Roger Dubuis Roger Dubuis is a pretty cool brand that could do a lot of different things in the future they have like enough stuff in their limited history that allow them to go in any number of wild directions a lot of people would be very lucky to revive that brand's uh, creativity but that brand has like like really really um, low demand. And a lot of it is because if you think about it, other than sort of like some of their wild 
skeletonized designs, turbions, and something related to motorsports, it's very vague what anything about this brand actually means. And, you know, uh, connecting it to the fact they do, you know, see a lot of Seal of Geneva watches and things like that. Like, it just, it, no average person can explain the brand. Most watch enthusiasts can't explain the brand. I think that's what's interesting. It's like, if you can't sum up the brand in a sentence or two, then the brand has done a real big problem of, of what's going on. And some brands used to be able to, like Mont Blanc. Oh, the nice watches the pen maker makes. Okay. Now it's like, explain Mont Blanc watches. And <laughs> I'm, I'm like, well, uh, where do I start? You take away all the oxygen and then. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, first you're like, what do you want to spend? <laughs> you know? Um, and so certain brands have gummed up what is any semblance of a cohesive message. And so the two issues are one, not communicating at all, which is very common. And two, it's like communicating a message which is like garbage in, garbage out. No consumer knows how to really make sense of it because it doesn't make sense to begin with. And that doesn't allow people to sort of form a relationship. And so is it obvious who is keeping, I mean, I guess Rolex is like most things is always answered this is who keeps their messaging the simplest so they don't trip themselves up. We're going to have a quick look at this uh, at Omega Speedmaster Chronoscope for Paris 2024, which to me is an example of a watch that is gumming up the works for Omega in that it's not really telling. A a coherent story is Omega Olympics, timing. But this just appears to be coming more and more gummed up as to what it is and what Omega's relationship to the Olympics is it's just like it's just a mess uh, I don't know whether it's a fallback from COVID and the delay of the Olympics but it, it's just not a simple story anymore it should be a simple story it should be a simple story Omega does stopwatches you use stopwatches in races this doesn't appear to be that are there other brands that are just getting more and more muddled or they're not simplifying the message. They're making it. They're, they're thinking that more complex messaging actually makes it easier for consumers. When in fact, it makes it might make it easier for geeks, but it doesn't make it any easier for the actual mass consumer who's trying to engage with a mass market watch. Thoughts, anyone? Well, when was it ever about making it easy for the mass consumer? <laughs> Especially when it comes to luxury watches. The more confusing it is, the better, normally. I, I, and is that is that the basic problem in that people are trying to keep luxury watches luxury, which implies a very, very small scale, when in fact these brands are making millions of watches. It's not like... Other luxury items, I think that's the one of the inherent contradictions of the luxury watch industry, is it's actually mass production, which unlike most other luxury things, you know, anything else luxury you can think of, luxury cars, like proper luxury cars, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, top-end Porsches, whatever, there's a low production, whereas actually, Omega, luxury watch brand, making a million watches. So is there an inherent contradiction there? Well, two things. First, luxury has to be by design confusing. If you think about it, everything that's luxury from checking into a a posh hotel to, you know, whatever else you can think of, figuring out the sizing of Gucci products or, you know, whatever. (laughs) It's meant to be stupid and confusing and arbitrary. So sometimes, you know, I I think people are like, this is not luxury if it makes sense. Uh, if you're nice and confused, like why would uh-huh. Omega celebrate 100 days to the Olympics, which is again completely arbitrary, it doesn't make any <laughs> sense, then you're like, okay, well, this now I have to like think about why I try and justify this. So that's, that's that. With cars, it's different because, you know, most of the, the car makers you mentioned use mass-produced, you know, stuff like a Lamborghini Urus and Audi, you know, underneath, basically. Yes. Um, so it is mass-produced in a way, you know, all the switches and most of most all of the gear that you look in, that I look at and touch and the drivetrain and all the rest of it, it's mass-produced by Audi. So mm-hmm. even there, I think it's true. Um, you know, fashion, luxury fashion, most all of it that you see around you is also mass-produced. So uh, I don't think it's just watches, to be fair. Okay. Ariel? 
<laughs> There's a lot of things that come to mind when I when I see this watch. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that these brands are all addicted to um, uh, what I call the new watch high. They just always want to have a new watch to sell. They're just like, guys, we, we need something new to sell. Um, <clears throat> apparently that doing this is successful enough because consumers just sort of like, oh, there's something new. I, 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 I you know, they, they like having that sort of part of retail therapy for a lot of people. But it also shows how difficult it is for a brand like Omega to sell anything that you would call core. Um, I'd like to think that just the standard Speedmaster is popular enough to sell on an ongoing basis to new watch lovers. Yet, what do they do? No, they have to keep varying it up, which tells me that they're talking to the same people over and over and over again and they must have figured it out it's like if you introduce someone to like a hundred new speed masters they'll buy one but it takes a hundred of them for them to decide like oh i won't so they never know which of those hundreds is going to be but if they introduce enough new models it's like your brain forces you to be like oh god i have to have one of them so i, I think that's maybe they will on. stop after well herein lies the reason why omega's catalog has like one hundred fifty thousand SKUs. You know, you just you have one of everything, and you, something something's going to stick. I actually like the, these chronoscopes, though. If we're being totally honest, it's so refreshing to see an Olympic watch that isn't like a Seamaster Pro or Speedmaster. It's refreshing, and I can't believe I'm saying that about a hundred days to Olympics watch. But like uh, it, the fact that it just isn't another you know Seamaster or Speedmaster, they've kind of gone the chronoscope route. Yeah, why not? Now you can check the athlete's pulse. They're trajectory the race all of all of the scales on it you know i for the for the person who just wants to follow along it makes about as much sense as anything so yeah why not you know i uh what? the only thing they missed out was not doing a bronze gold version to complete a trio and being able to you know offer that as a, a three-part set let's not forget that the olympics require omega to give out a heck of a lot of watches there's a lot of palms to grease and they have to give out o Olympic swatches, right? So they have to assume that, what, <clears throat> half the production is being given out as a gift? Wow. Are these I the just ones want... that they get, though? Or do they do the athletes participating get a different type of Look, watch? Look, there's, there's thousands and thousands of quote-unquote important people that you want on your side there. Like, we just have to assume that there's different tiers of bribes they need to give out, and somebody's getting these. <laughs> I, I just want one that says on the case back, Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> Olympics Participation Award? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Let's Olympics question mark. Before we get into hit and miss, maybe let's see if we can just touch on something that has been rummaging along. And we do occasionally touch on water resistance and what it actually means. And it would appear that Patek Philippe are trying to redefine the entire category all by itself by announcing that the Watch and Wonders releases from Patek are all 30 meter water resistance. But the, what that means is you can actually take it to 30 meter, which I think in old money would have been 120 meter water resistance. I'm not quite sure how it works. Did anybody have any chats with anyone at Patek Philippe about this particular pitch? They're about the least fun brand to have a discussion with at Watches and Wonders. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no offense to them. They had some beautiful stuff. I love walking by their booth. And one of our top 10 watches of the show was the Patek. Um, so we definitely have a lot of fondness with what they do. But man, do they set themselves up as an easy target sometimes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're taking this like let's not ask people thing to a real new level. Yeah, I, I mean, they're not. the problem is they're not wrong. Like, it does make much more sense what they're proposing, that if we say it's 30 meter water resistance, then at 30 meters and a half, your watch will leak. Uh, but, you know, rather than this kind of... Are they using the same terminology? Oh, I don't know. But because as that, I understand that... it, they're just saying 30 meters water resistance, and then there's a big spiel about what that actually means. So, and for some reason, they've yeah. decided to redefine it. I think what they're doing is entirely appropriate, but it benefits them to use slightly different terminology. So they're not telling people, hey, be confused for the sake of being confused. It's we think the other people are confusing. We're going to give you a slightly different term. I think that that's the right way of doing it. 
Mm. I mean, they're saying it's a unified superlative standard. Su- superlative of- water resistance. Superlative water resistance. <laughs> let's let's uh, quickly trademark that, Ariel. <laughs> Boom. Uh, yeah, they're, they're basically saying that it's a new unified standard. I'm not sure how it's a unified standard if the only people using it are protected. They're the only ones that matter. Everyone in the office has said yes, sir, so it's definitely unified. Ah, right, okay. Yes, Mr. Stern. Yes, Mr. Stern. Of course, Mr. Stern. 30 meters? Of course. How deep is your swimming pool, Mr. Stern? 30 meters? That's fine. This box will take to the bottom of it. Uh, any other thoughts on water resistance and the incomprehensibility of of the term, Ripley? Well, I mean, this has been, if you like, go on the watch forums. This is like the, (laughs) one of the most common things next to people debating the merits of crystal materials. It's like, what do depth ratings mean? Because you, you've got some brands being like, it's 150 meters. Don't go out in the rain. And you're like, (laughs) that makes absolutely no sense. You've got other people like Timex being like, yeah, 50 meters, go do whatever you want with it. Yeah. They're like, what do you, 50 meters is fine. They're like, yeah, we have other ones at 30 and those are fine. You know, there's people who literally taken a Casio F91W and a Timex Weekender, both 30 meters water resistance down to 28 point something meters, you know, max recreational diving type of thing. And and they've been fine. So like to a certain degree, you know, these are based on static pressure tests and all of that. But like Patek would really do better, like Ariel said, of either changing the vernacular surrounding it or really outlining outlining what this actually means in effect and how their process is thus different versus what was being done before. Um, it's a bit confusing as it stands. And it, you know, more than that, it kind of undermines everything else they've done before. Like if you have an aquanaut from a, a year ago and it's 120 meters, what does that now mean? Uh-huh. You know, is it, it's probably not, you know, four times as water resistant as their new 30 meter one, but are they going to like retroactively change the depth rating on your watch? Like, do you think if you send not. it back for ser- you think if you send it back for servicing they'll swap out the dial so that it now says thirty meters or the case back? Just fill in the case back and have something <laughs> else like, written there. C- well, cover it in. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think to be fair, the water resistance as a whole for the industry needs to, you know, kind of have a a more transparent thing. Some, you know, that kind of more correlates to what you can actually do with it. So I, I support what Patek's doing, but I think that the way that they've presented it is needlessly confusing. Yeah, I think an independent standard is required and I think we should be the ones to set it. We need to find somewhere nice and sunny that we can drop all the watches on a fishing line uh, down to whatever depth they say and then we'll monitor it and see. But it needs to be somewhere I have, sunny. I have one, somewhere one with thing little, to say little umbrellas and drinks, ideally. Yes. The one thing that's pissed oh. me off the most is when I've had a pretty durable sounding divers watch or sports watch that has failed with water resistance. And this has happened a few times where a watch that I'm not saying it was like, sometimes they were new actually. Uh, and, and, or sometimes they were like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years old. Sometimes the new ones, the brands would be like, Oh, um, that's a prototype. I'm like, how much diff, how different does the prototype <laughs> from the original have to be when it comes to water resistance? Like, you have round gaskets and stuff. I don't understand what's going on. And so I've had situations where watches that like definitely should have handled swimming in the pool have not been <laughs> able to handle that. And that's maybe that's an issue with defectiveness more so than design flaw. But I think that generally speaking, if you're into watches for a few years, you know what a watch should be able to put up with and not like if it has no oh. screw down crown and it's a minute repeater, just don't take it in your water. You know, just like, <laughs> just that simple. Or if like, if it's a diver's watch and it looks pretty beefy and it's got a screw down crown, like, yeah, you can take it underwater. You'll probably be okay. And like, I think that the form of the watch probably speaks enough. And I would, I just ignore, again, most of the ratings. What watch have you come the closest to absolutely ruining because you accidentally took it in water because you were like reviewing it or something and forgot that uh, actually this isn't water resistant the same way that the the watch I normally wear is? Just your standard thousand shaves? meter dive watch. <laughs> no, no close shaves with breaking out loner watches by accidentally showering with them or going out. It's it's less of a danger, in, I suppose, in California than it is in Scotland. Accidentally wear Speedmaster outside, gets it ruined by the rain. 
Yeah. Uh, Ari, Ari is searching his mind right now. You can see he, he's gazing dreamily into this thing. Like, what, Water's his never been room? an issue. I, other day. <laughs> yeah. Never. <laughs> My Speedmaster's been submerged. It's 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 no worse off for it. Um, but I <laughs> no have... worse off. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted more damage. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the 100 percent uh, H2O version, not the zero percent oxygen. The zero percent yeah. oxygen version. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I, nothing's I, more disappointed than the foggy dial, right? The foggy dial is the yeah. worst. Oh gosh, foggy <laughs> dial. <laughs> that should, that should be like the. Uh, you know, you know how you have these shows that review TV shows. You know, the kind of fan like that. That should be the show that reviews this show. It should just be called the Foggy Dial. That sounds like a kind of fan zone thing. So, if somebody would like to have a Foggy Dial podcast, do get in touch. <laughs> podcast at vlogtowatch That could be a that could be like a, else, a pub. I could see a pub or a bar the being called dial. the Foggy Dial. Yeah, I think maybe well, maybe that should do it. We should set up in competition with Red Bar. A group called the Foggy Dial. Here we go. That, no. I like that. That's <laughs> a good name. It's a good name. We need to find a if you happen to know a club. A, <laughs> if you happen to know a bar or a restaurant or anything anywhere in the world that is called the Foggy Dial, then let us know and we will come and we will meet. Maybe there. like a hookah lounge out here or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's well good. if if uh, yeah, okay, let's let's leave that there. Ripley, just you know, you, you can go to that meeting yourself. <laughs> right, we're gonna <laughs> gather to play Hit Miss Maybe. We have four watches to review this week. Uh, you may be listening to this on the podcast and get to hear all four. Depends on how long it takes us to review them, I guess. But if you don't get to hear all four, then you will be able to find all four at a blog to watch weekly live on YouTube. So go and check that out. But we're going to let in some guests and play Hit Miss Maybe. Okay, we welcome for Hit Miss Maybe a three interlopers from all over the world, actually. So let's do the usual and go around the room, see who everybody is, where everybody is, and what they are wearing. Let's stop, start, let's start even with who's top left of my screen, which is Mr. Ripley, the Great Wall Sellers. Where are uh, you and what are you wearing? Back in LA, um, Jake actually took a photo of inside the Rolex booth to figure out how to place behind me in lieu of this wall. So once we figure that out, expect a glorious fluted update. Um, I'm in LA and wearing a garment. Ario, where are you? What are you wearing? For the time being, until tomorrow, I'm in Los <laughs> Angeles. And um, I'm wearing an Elka Lake Diver, which specifically is for diving in a lake. Don't take it in a salty body <laughs> of water. <laughs> With the lake, that's okay. Sound destruct. Lakes and lakes only. David, what watch is on your desk and where is your desk? My desk is in Budapest and there's no watches on it, to be honest. Do you honest. actually own any watches? Are they all just I do. outside? <laughs> I, I see a baby G, but it's not mine. So there's, there's a baby a G. G. A baby G is just over there. <laughs> that's not my baby David's G. David's so reminded me that's, of that's not my the, baby the, G. the football player that refused to stand up. That's like him not wearing, you know, during the anthem. <laughs> That, that's yeah. like him not wearing a, a watch. We don't know why he's doing it anymore, but he feels like he's gone this f- long and he just can't he can't go back can't now. He can't it, abandon can't the mission. Uh, yeah. I just I do, you, you know those, uh, uh, for those that have got kids, are you familiar with those books, That's Not My Tractor and That's Not My Pet? David's got That's Not My Baby G. That's a sequel <laughs> to that R, is, that R is for Rolex book. That's a sequel. A million copies uh, sold. <laughs> coming to a bookshop near you sometime mr rob how are you this morning and where are you this morning and what are you wearing this morning i'm very well i'm in dresden in my office and today i'm wearing a arcanaut arc 2 linear four day and you can very dive nice. with this in lakes and in the oceans 100 meters water resistance so. <laughs> very good and but and where rob rob just for the record where is dresden near well, it's about two hours south of Berlin <laughs> and about half an hour north of the Czech Republic. So. That's, not, that's not the only that's answer you're going to give. We know the other Glasseter. answer. <laughs> it's near Glasseter. <laughs> Thanks uh, for Mr. asking. <laughs> Mr. Pete McConville, where are you and what are you wearing today? Um, Melbourne, Australia, and I'm wearing a Breitling Super Ocean 44 bronze. 
Very nice. Looking, look, it's the, the, the smallest looking 44 mil Breitling I've ever seen. Your wrist must be enormous. Look at that. It, um, looks, it looks like a no, tiny 36 mil watch. I have an on, average on your size vast sleeve. I have an average size wrist for a healthy Australian. Um, eight inches. <laughs> a healthy Australian. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good wrist st- this is a wrist <laughs> that's right <laughs> uh, that's not stuff. a wrist uh, that's a finger guy the strap monitor <laughs> welcome the strap monitor to the show guy where are you this morning i am on the sunny south coast of britain nepal and it is a sunny south coast today and yeah i'm wearing a prototype of the Trash player one which can dive in lakes and seas and helps keep the seas clean. Ah, Even better. You, you see, we're just we're just upping the game as we go along the, 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 the line there. I'm in Scotland. It is sunny. I am wearing a Panerai. That is all you need to know. Let's get on with our first watch. And we have four watches today that are of a similar nature in that they're all, you know, monsters within their within the realm. So first up is this little thing from Moser, the H Moser and C Streamliner Cylindrical Turbion Skeleton Alpine Limited Edition watch. So Ripley, you have reviewed this watch. I don't know if you have seen it. No, no, no. Tell us a story. So um, Alpine, uh, for those Formula One fans, they are not having a good year. They are currently (laughs) tied a three-way tie for last place with zero points, which means I've scored as many points as them from the comfort of my couch this season. Uh, <laughs> their, their car is an absolute... It, it, it's the slowest thing on the grid. They might as well be pushing a red wagon. But they get this awesome watch. Uh, Moser picked up the slack when Bell & Ross left, so now Moser's their um, their timepiece sponsor. And so as soon as it was announced, we started seeing various different streamliner models. Uh, they've made this one for the team. Uh, it's got a blue synthetic spinel dial. That's some type of gemstone up there. Skeletonized flying tourbillon movement. Um, you know, a- a- and strangely, no Alpine branding anywhere on it whatsoever, uh, which I think is probably a, a-, a good move. Um, but, you know, all things considered, this is now Alpine's, uh, you know, signature watch. And personally, it's come a significant way up from the Bell & Ross they had last year. Good stuff, right? Well, that's an introduction. Let's see. Is it a hit, a miss, or a maybe? One, two, three, go. Maybes, hits, misses, some hits. Ariel is voting a hit and a hit from Pete. Okay, let's go through it. Ripley, the team's crap, but the watch is a hit. Uh, I I like the French team. Um, uh, They... (laughs) I, I, I think this is an appropriate watch for for the French team. French is the native language of both brands. Neither are necessarily a practical decision if you're looking for outright performance. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a 100% great watch for Alpine. But honestly, I, I think this is far more interesting than, like, uh, the Richard Mills that Ferrari and McLaren have. Definitely more interesting than the Monaco's that the ta- uh, the Red Bulls have from, from TAG. So, um, yeah, you know, I... Yeah. This is probably my favorite signature F1 watch right now, so definitely a hit. Ariel, how did you vote? I gave it a hit because, first, this movement is really cool to watch. Um, it's one of the more interesting higher-end movements that H. Moser produces, and I mostly wore it uh, i've seen, seen it in a, in a different form but it's a really cool movement and um it's just it's it's you know if you can afford it it's fun the the streamliner case uh with the strap obviously looks very different than sort of the uh on the bracelet as we're accustomed to but i think it 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 does its job well so it's a quirky looking watch but given uh the market segment it's in and and how it's meant to compete it's actually quite competitive and so if i had to choose something like that wouldn't be a bad choice you could definitely go a lot worse Hmm. david could you go a lot worse or a lot better than this I think you could uh, do a lot worse, yeah. I don't care too much about watches that are Formula 1 themed, but you can't wear it inside the car while racing, so it's it's more of just like them just slapping Formula 1 or a theme or something, a team or something on the case back. But it's a beautiful execution. It's already just a great movement. I just I just like this watch very much. I would mm-hmm. wear it around for the summer. Yeah, I give it a maybe, though, because I think it needs the bracelet. 
it doesn't work without the bracelet. That's just that's my opinion. But we'll see whether Guy agrees with that strap analysis shortly. Uh, Rob, are you a Formula One fan? Does this make you a Formula One fan? Could anything make you support Alpine as a team? Well, I am a Formula One fan, uh, not the most ardent. I don't dislike Alpine and I like a plucky loser. So that's uh, <laughs> something at least. Uh, I do like the fact that the watch isn't branded in that way. I think that's smart for lots of reasons. Uh, the strap is interesting. It looks to me like it's a component, uh, at least development share with Ortlons because they use very similar rubber straps and also similar colors. But for me, the lack of the bracelet is what really made me give it a miss. And also the uh, unnecessary complication from what I regard as one of the best daily wear modern sports watches going. I think it looks more like a collab with Bove than it does with a regular collection piece from Moser. But is it a bad watch? No, the price is actually pretty good for what it is, uh, certainly within the Moser catalog. But no, I gave it a miss because I love the Streamliner, but this is a step too far for me. And I don't think that I need all that technology on display for a collab with an F1 team. Yeah, I was surprised at the price. 89,000 USD strikes me as almost reasonable. But uh, th there we go. Guy, would you spend your $89,000 oh, on this watch? I felt like last week I was agreeing with Rob, and now I'm like totally disagreeing. Um, I like, That's the I beauty hate, of this game. I hate F1 <laughs> to start off with, yeah. and I really don't like the Moses Streamliner, but I really like this one. Um, <laughs> I think this is a beautiful watch. I love it. I, I love the colour. I, I actually love the strap. I think the strap on the the metal strap on the normal streamliner reminds me of like 80s Abel straps, um, which is <laughs> a good thing on a like two thousand pound Abel watch, which I quite I like. I quite like an Abel watch. I think they should have a revival. To be honest, but I think this is way nice. I think this is way nicer than the normal one. I don't like the normal ones. But I think this is lovely. The movement looks great. The colour looks great. I would definitely wear this, 100%. Good stuff. Pete, I seem to recall you're a bit of an F1 fan. Do you think there is ribbing within the paddock because the best team has to wear tag hoyer? And do you think all the other guys go, oh, I'm wearing a Moser. Here's my Richard Mille. There you go. I have a strong suspicion they couldn't care less who they're sponsored by. Um, they all make enough money not to have to worry about what <laughs> anyone else thinks. Uh -huh. um, no, I I had this watch as a hit. <laughs> I'm actually almost exactly lined up with Guy. I, I remember the first time I saw the Streamliner and I kind of wondered what the fuss was about. And it's not until they add things that I find it really attractive. So I, I like this streamliner, this has got something interesting in it. I can take or leave the bracelet. The band is fine. So, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of this iteration of the streamliner. Good stuff, right? Well, let's move on to what is next. And we're sticking with the kind of avant-garde world. There are, I don't know how many iterations they've been through recently, but uh, this is their next attempt at a comeback. And this is HYT. This is the HYT T1 watches with the brand's first closed dial. So we've gone from open worked at the Moser to closed HYT. Uh, what shall we say about this? Ariel, you had a hands on with this. Quickly give us a starter for 10. So this is HYT relaunching, in a sense, themselves again. They've decided to do something very different than before. They've tried to reduce the size as much as possible. This is their first closed dial, something they've not done before. So they're sort of seeing how that goes. It's not going to define them forever. The new case, as I said, is smaller with sort of a detachable bracelet. The movement is an update on the original movement in that it improves upon it. It doesn't. It wasn't introduced in this watch, but just as I'm saying compared to the very original fluidic uh, movement that HYT came out with. This is an improvement in a lot of ways and it's more reliable. Uh, it's actually quite comfortable um, on the wrist. Um, you know, they come out with a few new versions uh, and the price point is actually around the same price that the HYT watches originally were priced at back in 2012. So not too much higher. So um, in this scheme of things, I guess, affordable. So I think one of the most important things to say that's positive about it is that it has 
the interest that you can get from this sort of uh, HYT experience with, uh, you know, a movement you don't have to worry about maybe breaking or not operating as you might in a, in a watch from a brand, brand new brand. Hmm. Good stuff. Right. Well, let's give it a vote. So on the count of three, is it hit? Is it miss? Or is it maybe? One, two, three, go. Hits, maybe. So I miss. I miss what's house Pete voting. Pete is voting. I miss as well. So a couple of misses. Right. Ripley. Why is it a newbie? Um, I got to see these well in Geneva. Um, it, it, it's, it succeeds at doing what it set out to do, which is to create a, more, a smaller, more wearable more mainstream version of HYT's, you know, signature fluid time display thing. Uh, for me, though, I really like the brand when they're at the absolute craziest. Uh, so this is just a bit, you know, a bit too conservative, and it, it doesn't really showcase the liquid display as much as I, I think other models have. I love those ridiculous things that are just like a can of beans stuck on the wrist with all the, you know... Like, shattered mirror liquid stuff like give me all of that you know it, it really is something that i think you don't want to make a toned down pagani car it's supposed to be this wild exotic thing and that's kind of how i feel about the watches that said um some of the ones like the that thing with the rotating green planets on it last year absolutely unwearable for anyone who doesn't have i guess peach wrists so, you, you know this is like <laughs> literally the most wearable hyt i've ever put on it's definitely the most, you know, mainstream one that you could probably get along with in regular life. So it's a maybe for me. It's just, you know, I really love the brand when they're full crazy, even if I can't wear it. So, yeah, I can't love it. Well, thank you very much, Ripley, for giving Pete his new moniker, Pete the Risma McConville. Uh, Ariel, is this the watch that's going to save HYT? How did you vote? I said maybe, um, but it's sort of like a, a maybe plus. I, I like a lot of this watch. I'm actually wanting to see an open dial version of this i liked the kind of more wild hyt i wanted to be a little bit more futuristic for me i'm a little bit let down there so i like the movement i i i feel very strongly that some great improvements the fluidic concept is is genuinely fun the case is neat i just want to see the dial uh kind of be a little bit more playful and fun as to sort of the hyt that i'm thinking about yeah david how'd you vote I voted Miss just because um, I love HYT. I think it's a great brand. I, I love the concept. Well, not a great brand at the moment because it's had, it's, had its uh, ups and downs and mostly downs uh, the last couple of years. But the concept is amazing, the way they've worked this out. Um, and for me, it's just a miss because, you know, I, I would literally miss seeing all, all the things that I'm paying for when I'm buying an HYT. So, yeah, yeah, that's why. Yeah, I think I voted her. And I think I voted hit because it, it, it's a watch that has liquid that moves around in it. Of course it's a hit. You can't be anything else. Look at it. It's awesome. Rob, is it is it on the awesome scale or is it a flop? No, for me, it's a, it's a great reset for the brand. I agree with everything Ripley, David and Ariel said, to be honest. Uh, I think that it's incredible. Which is collectively a hit and miss and a maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think... Oh, oh. All, all the comments were totally valid, um, totally good points, because it's a bit of a mishmash. It is everything at once, to be fair, because, um, yeah, I miss like seeing the workings a little bit more clearly. I do, but I know that they're coming back, and I think that this case design and the execution thereof is so good and so much more wearable, and yeah, okay, it's still around a 50K watch, so it's not cheap, but bringing the watch back to that price point was a great move and exactly what I think they need to do in this climate and it's a great foundation for what is yet to come. And the finishing on the dials, which I was really worried about from the renders I saw before I had it on my wrist, is a lot better than I realized. So I think there's potential there to do a lot with this platform. Okay. Who's got the dog in the room? Because somebody's dog's oh, crying on the screen. My, my, dog is, my dog's crying to my wife. I'll, I'll let her out then. She'll, she'll cry to get back in in a minute. Yeah, that's fine. Well, is it shedding a tear over this watch guy? Wow. Uh, strap in particular? Not strap quite. Strap looks like strap you might have an opinion on. does tape. I don't mind the tape that much. Um, I kind of agree with Ariel. I was going to say maybe minus, but I kind of agree with Ariel. It's just, it looks, the back of it looks awesome. Like, the back looks amazing. Um, and then it's just, you kind of even don't know it's got that liquid movement until you, like, you've got to read about it to find out. Um, and it's weird that it's got like a kind of retro dial when if it had a clear dial and you could see the movement, it would look much cooler. So I wouldn't wear it. I wouldn't buy it, but I, I think like 
making movements out of liquids kind of a cool thing to do. Yeah. Pete, the rest of McConville, how did you vote? I I was kind of split on this. I understand why it makes sense for the brand. It might be super successful for the brand. But personally, it's not enough. Um, I want more. Hmm. Okay, okay, well, let's see if any of the next two watches give us some more. If uh, if you don't get the chance to hear these on the podcast, then do tune in to YouTube. So next up is a watch that... I think Ripley, you reviewed. Yes, you did. This is the Vanguard Orb Levitating Flying Turbion Watch, which sounds like a lot of words to describe something, but is it worthwhile, Ripley, give us the lowdown? Yeah, this is super, this one's super cool. Um, it's, uh, it's a flying tourbillon. The movement's got a very interesting and very symmetrical architectural layout, which is nice. Um, the crown doesn't pull out. It's a button sort of like an RM. So it switches between manual winding, automatic winding and, uh, time setting modes for the hands now. And that's displayed on the barrel at 12 o'clock tourbillons at the six. Now, the kind of cool feature about this is if you look between the chapter ring with the hour markers in the central section with the mechanics of the movement, you have this sloped bowl shaped ring with a single diamond, uh, two millimeter brilliant cut diamond mounted in it. And that's actually the rotor. It's a peripheral rotor mounted to the front side of the movement. And when you have it set in its automatic mode, that diamond just kind of levitates to the top because it's set at the opposite side of the oscillating rate. Um, really cool in the, that regard. And since all the automatic works are there, we get a cool view through the case back. Um, the version here, it's a, it was a prototype, so it doesn't have all those same engravings. But um, really cool piece, fun to watch it go. And when you press the button to switch it to like manual winding, the diamond uh, snaps back in the lines of the 12 o'clock position, which is kind of cool. Um, but, you know, you can get in rose gold or titanium, uh, interchangeable strap system, a uh, very interesting piece. And the front crystal has this interesting concave profile that sort of curves along the vertical axis. So it really has this unique uh, futuristic appearance. And I've got tiny wrists. Um, so you can see in the photos, it's not at all a chonker. Not a chonker, but is it a hit, a miss, or a maybe? One, two, three. We'll go. Miss, some hits, a good selection. Ripley, you gave it a hit. You sticking with that? Not persuaded otherwise? No, no, it, it is shockingly expensive uh, to the point where you, you, you should just get the rose gold version because in for a penny, in for a pound at this point, you know. Uh, <laughs> it, it's shockingly expensive for what it is. Um, they're obviously not going to make that many of them. And it's not a limited edition thing. It's an output thing. It's just, you know, they don't have a giant output to begin with, but it's so much fun to have on the wrist. And as you move around, this kind of diamond floats to the top against the concave crystal. Uh, it looks re really cool on paper. I was excited to see it, but it, it really needs to kind of be messed with in your hands and played with and have a good time to really appreciate it. Um, and for me, it was one of the most fun watches I had on my wrist all week in Geneva. I give it a miss because apart from how shockingly expensive it is, I'm sorry, that crown just looks like a carbuncle on the side of the watch. Somebody needs to take a hacksaw and just make it half the size. So on that basis, it's a miss. Ariel, how did you vote? I thought it was a hit. Um, I like this brand. These watches are more or less produced by APRP, where uh, Audemars Piguet, Renault Poppy, where a lot of fantastic, mm. cool, high-end stuff is made. In a lot of ways, for me, this is where the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Concept Collection uh, probably should have gone, and that mm. collection has been kind of stuck in, in limbo. It's sort of the same <laughs> case and not really doing too much. And so, yes, it's shockingly expensive, just like those were shockingly expensive. Um, but we, we want at least for there to be individuality and originality to those shockingly expensive watches. And that's what this brand is delivering. So where some of the, the mo more noteworthy brands have just sort of stopped, uh, these uh, individuals have used the same engineers and industrial uh, you know, uh, construction capacity to make what really should be the next generation there. And you'll see this sort of swoopy design, um, I think, in a lot more things. So I think it's kind of cool looking. And again, it has that distinctiveness. It can be sort of a, 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 a new icon so to say and with a movement that really doesn't perform like any others and and i think that's what we should love about it david you do like a, a bit of bling you do like the occasional diamond does this float your boat 
Uh, I do like the organic shape very much, and I like the concept, but I don't like the fact that I, that when I first saw it, I thought this is a $5,000 watch. Um, which is to say, not that this is bad, but to say that the sub-10,000 micro-brand tourbillon market is so f flipping strong that at this point, if you make something for 150000 there's a solid chance that even like someone who, who's around watches all the time might be fooled into thinking like maybe this does not look quite as expensive as it should be, right? Mm. I, I do like the, the flowing design and the organic uh, uh, approach and, and that's very, very cool. I'm just not sure that this is the one I would go for um, to spend my imaginary 150000 Good stuff, Rob. Uh, we haven't established your Bling credentials yet on this show as to whether you like the occasional diamond or not. How did you vote in this? I'm certainly not against the occasional diamond or many of them. If anyone wants to send some through to dress, I'd happily <laughs> receive them. But Which is near glass yeah. I Just send it to glass Which is near glass by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, just a stone's throw away. But <laughs> I, like the, uh, I like the organic style of it, yeah. I, I feel like we are on... Uh, Cusp or in the early days already of like a bit of a 90s, early 2000s revival with some of the stylings. I think we saw some of it from Zenith as well with some of their new dive pieces, uh, Watches and Wonders. So this is completely in a different direction, more design led. I think that the movement is interesting. Like David said, there's a lot of competition at the sub 10 bracket and this is crazy money, but it's a small team doing some interesting stuff with good quality movements. I gave it a maybe because I just don't like it at the end of the day. I think it's a pretty good effort, and I think that the design is you know, challenging and goes in the right direction, but it's just not for me. I just don't find it attractive. The first one was better, in my opinion. Guy, points for effort. How'd you vote? Uh, I gave it a miss because I think it's ugly. I just think it's ugly. I think the crown's ridiculous and I don't like the shape. But then everything Ripley said, I was like, yeah, that's cool that they've done that, but it's ugly. And then Ripley would say <laughs> something else, and I'd be like, yeah, but that's yeah, but it's still ugly. <laughs> um, so, like uh, engineering, like ten out of ten, well done. But it, you've made something that's engineered beautifully and looks ugly, in my opinion. Pete, Pete, how would this look on your substantial wrist? I think this would look great if someone wants to buy it for me. Uh, I went for, <laughs> I went for um, a, a sort of a, a maybe plus. Um, I read the words and I loved the idea. And I kept thinking, I'd love to be able to talk to the photographer and say, was this a really hard watch to photograph? Because I get yes, the feeling it was really hard to was. Yes, it was. <laughs> and, yeah. I, like, I, I'm Pete, in like a hotel room. Ripley. Yeah, I'm in a hotel room, like doing judo with a bounce board, trying to deal with like that, the crystal, which just was hell bent on catching everything in it. I, I kept thinking, I had my photographer hat on and listening to you describe it. And I'm thinking there is no way you can catch that in photos. That's going to be really hard. So I think I would, I suppose a couple of things. If you're paying $150,000 for a watch, price doesn't matter anymore. Um, so I don't worry about the price. Um, I just don't want it to look like anything else. And I want it to look special. And I think this would in hand, but because I'm relying so much on very difficult to take photographs, I'll, ta I'll call it a maybe plus. And maybe plus, I, I do like the fact that everyone's now inventing their own scoring system. <laughs> but it's, it shows that, everybody, shows that everybody cares. Right, let's see how much everyone cares about this final watch of today. One of David's favourite brands, but will this get his vote? The USC's Nardan Freak S Nomad Watch. I, gents, did you get to handle this at Watch and Wonders, those that were there? Yep. Uh, Rob, give us give us a give us a line or two on it. Well, uh, not to give away my uh, my ranking, but it was my favourite watch of the show. It's uh, <laughs> not to give away. Yeah. Spoiler alert! <laughs> <if you're laughs> <I guess. laughs> it's a bad show. <laughs> yeah, well, that could have been a statement and a half to make, but no, I think it's uh, stunning. The uh, Freak S is, I think, forty five millimeters. So even though the S suggests it's small, it's actually the largest of the freaks in the current collection but extremely wearable very lightweight I, for me it's got everything that you want for it from the freak which is an icon but it has this beautifully traditionally made dial which is not a typically freak est thing but i think it looks stunning to mix the ultra modern uh movement with this more guilloche style display and then the case with these little flakes of gold running through the carbon is just stunning it's lightweight it's comfortable sits down on the wrist there's only like 
I think 99 pieces and they're about 150,000. So not many people will have them. I certainly won't be able to get one, but if I could, I would, because it is the perfect realization of a free concept in my mind. Good stuff. Well, is it hit a miss or a maybe everybody? One, two, three, go. Oh, hit, hit, hit. Could it be a clean sweep? Pete, don't let us down. It's a clean sweep of hits. Ripley, give us your thoughts. Um, yeah, I largely agree with everything Rob said. Um, I like the freaking concept, in, and in most executions, I think it's a crack and watch. Um, this is everything you love about it, taken in a really modern direction that still checks all the major freak boxes. Um, love the color palette, love the guilloche on the not dial, dial, whatever their terminology is for that component. I know they don't want to call it a dial, so it's it's not a dial, but whatever. Uh, I, I I love it. Um, I, I think this is you know one of the cooler pieces. And if I was going to wear some like crazy hyper watch, um, I would want something distinct. So whether it would be the Vanguard or this, this is so, just so quintessential UN uh, and just taken in a really cool contemporary direction. Um, I think it's a it, I think it's a really cool piece. Again, one hundred fifty thousand dollars I don't have, but really really cool. And we could club together, like timeshare, timeshare watch. Ariel, you into timesharing this watch? Oh, wow. Time sharing it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do some uh, fractional ownership chip in, with somebody. Chip in something. Okay, okay, doke. I, uh, Why is it hit? I, I got to see this watch both in the show context and sort of out and about. I was hanging out with some of the Ulysses Nardon people and I was wearing it in the evening environment. And I mean, look, the, the freak is probably what the brand is entirely focused on right now. Like I actually can't think of a single other watch that <laughs> produces right now other than the freak. There might be one or two. I actually don't know where they are, but the freak, I know they make, they put a lot of effort behind it. And you can tell that, uh, you know, it's, it's, they want to, they really want to keep making each next freak better and better and better. Now that they have the grinder automatic winding system, um, and in some of the other improvements in there, like it's, it's very practical. You know, I remember the first freak had like, it was impaled. There was a pin through the case. It wasn't really water resistant. Like they've made the freak so much less freaky in terms of its ability just to be worn uh, on a regular basis. Um, that's great. Um, there's no theme. Nomad means nothing. S means nothing. The fact that the, you know, the colors are this and that means nothing. It's cool. And I love that it's the first time that, you know, Guilloche has been used on it. So it's a beautiful looking watch. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's designer hotelology at this point, uh, for better or worse. Um, so obviously there's room for you listen Ardan, to refine the brand messaging, but these are undeniably cool and, and fun to wear because they, seem to put all their eggs in this basket right now david you're a big un fan you're a fan of this oh yeah big time i think it's it's the freak turned up to 11 and it's modernized in a way that is actually crispy and fresh and not something that's retrogative so you know just uh, uh it's it's an exercise in watchmaking i think we have to come together and applaud even if you know the styling is not for everyone personally i love it i love the nomad i love the name and, and the overall this dune um you know style to it great watch love every bit of it good stuff rob it's turned all the way up to 11 is that a 12 for you yeah i mean i don't want to over exaggerate so we'll stick with 11 but i think it's absolutely yeah perfect what i want to see from the brands it takes the concepts even further it adds some lovely aesthetic elements that i wasn't expecting and that's great to still be surprised by yeah one of the most important watch families i think that we've seen in the last 25 years so four marks guy the nigel tufnell of the watch world uh, is it an 11 for you yeah I, I love it i think it's great i also think one of the things like for these concept watches um it's quite easy to sell the time on Whereas a lot of mine, <laughs> which uh, gives it an extra mark. It like it just looks cool. It's like really clever, but you can use it as a watch and tell the time on it, which I think is amazing. Love yes, it. Pete, that's going to be usable in your everyday life. Absolutely love this watch. If I had 150k to spend on a watch, this would be the one I'm buying. I think with a lot of other watches, you talk about form versus function. With this one, its form is its function. It just joins the two together perfectly. And yeah, I think it's it's the perfect high concept watch. Mm. Good stuff. I give it a hit because it's got a little thing on it that says "freak" across it, and who doesn't want to wear that? 
Anyway, right, so to conclude our show today, we have looked at four hyper watches. So very quickly around the room, Ripley, which one are you buying? Money, no object of the four. Ooh, um, yeah, I'll be taking the UN, uh, the, the Freak. That's um, the, the Freak followed by the Vanguard, but like it would be the Freak for me. I, I think it was an absolute home run from the brand. And um, because it is a larger brand, when my hyper watch needs service, I think I, I'll have an easier time going to my local UN boutique. Ariel, which one are you buying? Oh, wow. Uh, someone's spending my money now. <laughs> 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 I mean, these are all really, really cool watches. I think the Freak is such an obvious choice because it's it's so wearable um, and so cool and you can get away with it in so many instances. But I, I, I have to say the Vanguard one because it's a new up-and-coming brand and I like the weird stuff. I like that sort of polarizing. Um, their first watch, um, you know, it, it's the bla- the black hole tourbillon. It's just, it's just wild, weird stuff. <laughs> it kind of has the wildness that we we saw from HYT for a while. And and I think HYT will get back there. Um, so I mean, th- th- they're all great. But since since everybody wants the 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 freaks and they make so few, so few, I'll be I'll take the weird Vanguard. Okay. Weird Vanguard. <laughs> David, you're spending Ariel's money. What are you spending it on? I'm buying four nomads. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the whole tribe, okay? Buy the whole tribe. Well, for every an ankle. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> Christmas tribe. gifts for the Blog to Watch team. Uh, yes. Rob, which one are you buying? I mean, I guess if it was a for daily wear, I'd take the Freak. But if I was spending that kind of money, yeah, maybe I'd buy three HYTs just in case that movement isn't quite as reliable as it reckon it is. <laughs> Help the brand get back way. off its uh, back off the uh, starting <laughs> line, I think. So, yeah, Freak Guy. or HYT. Yeah. Uh, you have to buy based on the best strap. You're not like, you only like I'll, to buy I'll the straps. Actually, that's the easy. I'm totally, I'm getting the Moser and uh, keeping 80 grand change. Go, go party Gets. with it. Good stuff. And Pete, which one's going to look best on your gargantuan wrist? UN every day. I normally I try to be like different to the crowd, but I I can't this time. I'm going the UN. Excellent. So everyone's going with the flow. I'd buy in the UN, I think, as well. But there we go. Anyway, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, listeners and viewers, for listening and watching. If you have a comment for the show, please email podcast at our blog to watch.com or tap any of us up on social media and we hope to see you again sometime next week say goodbye everybody. and and when we say say goodbye every guy that doesn't mean you need to log off immediately guy just disappears we all say goodbye and guy just vanishes we get to have the post-match chat which nobody gets to hear so you're all right so anyway on the count of three everyone say goodbye goodbye bye, bye. 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 bye.